All right, hello, Shadle A. Bush. This is Mr. Homburg, um, and this is my lecture over periods two and three. Um, I know this is not the most exciting way to learn, but I'm going to go through this, and you can take breaks and do whatever you need to do, but uh, pull up a chair, a nice cup of Earl Grey, and uh, we'll dive in. So even though the AP exam, uh, even though the DBQ uh, will come from periods three through seven, um, it could also cover part of period two. So it won't exclusively deal with period two, but it could partial, partially um, cover period two. So that's why I'm going to quickly go through uh, period two, which is 1607 to 1754, and then we'll get into period three. Um, and we'll be covering these key concepts. Um, I'm not going to talk much more about them. You can pause the screen and read those if you want. And then these uh, learning objectives, these are the things that you should be able to do. I'm not going to cover every single one of these learning objectives with uh, this lecture. Um, but again, you can pause the screen and uh, look at those. So we're going to start off with the uh, the settling of the modern day United States and looking mainly at the, the three empires, the Spanish, the French, uh, and the British. We'll talk a little bit about the Dutch Empire as well. Um, uh, but uh, the Spanish Empire is mainly the southwestern part of the modern-day U.S. It was known as New Spain. Uh, the French Empire will go all the way from, from modern-day Canada down uh, to Louisiana. And the important thing about the French Empire is that they controlled a lot of the waterways, the main uh, rivers and lakes. You see the Great Lakes in there. Um, and then... Uh, the British uh, colonies, the 13 colonies that they will be uh, on, the, on the eastern part of America. And so if we jump to 1750, um, looking at the population, at 1750 uh, in British North America, there was about 1.5 million people. In France, there was about 60,000 people up in Canada and about 10,000 in Louisiana and New Spain at least the American portion, uh, was even lower than both of those. Um, so the British definitely had more people. The British were more likely to settle, whereas the Spanish were more about extracting wealth and bringing it back home. Um, and uh, the French and the Spanish will be Catholic, and uh, Britain will be Protestant. They will be the, uh, the Church of England. And so they're not really going to get along. The French and the Spanish get along, sort of. And, uh, but not with the British. They were enemies. Um, so uh, that's the settling. Uh, those are the main empires. The Dutch will also be there in modern day New York, known as New Amsterdam. Um, but if we, we're going to mainly focus on the, uh, the settling of the 13 colonies. And I'll quickly go through kind of the different regions here. So the first uh, permanent settlement will be in Jamestown in uh, Virginia there uh, in 1607. Now, when they got the charter from the king, uh, Virginia technically was was South Carolina up into Canada. It was that whole area. The borders will be more defined uh, later. Um, but the king gave a charter, meaning basically the authority to a company called the Virginia Company to settle uh, in America, they were a sent, that company was essentially the government. Um, they still retained their rights as Englishmen, but they were essentially um, on their own. They would rule themselves with local councils. Um, and their goal was to, to make money. It was a joint stock company, meaning they had various, various investors that would invest in the ship and the crew and go over to uh, the New World. And so this was kind of a nifty system for the British because the king uh, didn't have to put all this money into it. It was individual investors. Then once the colony does well, the king can revoke that charter 
and take over the colony. Um, so 1607, Jamestown uh, was settled uh, by what we call gentlemen adventurers. They really weren't uh, very good at farming, building things. They just wanted to find gold, silver, and copper. And uh, they weren't really worried about food either. They would uh, at first trade with the Native Americans, then the Native Americans got kind of upset and uh, refused to, to trade with the the uh, the colonists. And so uh, there was a famous winter uh, called the Starvation Winter the, in 1609 to 1610, that winter, um, where the population went from 500 to 60 during that winter. Uh, they couldn't get food. There was a drought. So even the Native Americans were actually not doing too well. Um, and there's accounts of them, of the colonists eating snakes, uh, eating horses, eating dogs, eating cats, eating mice. Uh, they even, there are accounts of people eating shoe leather, just eating leather, which I mean, sounds pretty good actually. Um, and there was even accounts of people digging up dead people and eating them. Um, so Jamestown is going to struggle, um, really until they start growing tobacco and they start exporting tobacco back to the old world, back to Europe where tobacco was uh, very popular. The Spanish had first brought tobacco, um, back home. And so, uh, the colony is going to take off. And by 1624, the King will revoke the charter for Jamestown and will, uh, take it over or, um, so let's now um, jump up to uh, New England. And uh, New England uh, will be settled uh, in 1620. The first uh, settlement there uh, will be in Plymouth, uh, modern day Massachusetts. And it will be settled by William Bradford. He will be their, their leader. And these people were, they were Protestants, but they were known as, a, uh, they were known as the separatists. Um, because they wanted to separate completely from the Church of England. So uh, England used to be Catholic. They became Protestant because the king wanted to get a divorce. Um, and so uh, even though they were Protestant, they were, you know, the Church of England, they retained a lot of Catholic practices. And so the Puritans didn't like that. They wanted to purify the Church of Eng England of all Catholic practices. Um and so the separatists wanted to com completely separate from the Church of England, um, whereas we will get the, the Puritans, as we call them, the non-separating Puritans in Massachusetts Bay, who will be led by John Winthrop. Eventually, Plymouth and Mass Massachusetts Bay will be absorbed into one colony. Um, so you have the, the separating Puritans and then the non-separating Puritans. The non-separating Puritans really uh, hoped to reform the Church of England. Um, they hoped to, to mend that relationship. Um, so in Plymouth, they're famous for the Mayflower Compact. This was a central, because they were originally sailing towards Virginia and they got blown off course and they landed in, in, in Cape Cod up there in Massachusetts. And so the Mayflower Compact is essentially a governing document uh, laying out the rules. Now, it's not necessarily an example of democracy in America. Um, this, this document was signed by, I think, 41 people, all men. So women did not sign this document, basically agreeing to certain things. Um, John Winthrop and the, the Puritans, as we call them, uh, he's famous for a model of Christian charity. This was a sermon he gave, uh, essentially saying that these, these Puritans, we are going to be uh, the example of the city upon a hill, as he called it, a shining example of what it means to live a Christian life. That's what they wanted to build. What's interesting about them is they themselves weren't very, they weren't tolerated in England. They, they left to Holland. They spent about 10 years there and then they came to America. They themselves really weren't treated uh, very well in Europe, um, but they also didn't treat other religions very well. They weren't really accepting of other belief systems. And, and in, an example of this is uh, uh, when they uh, kicked Roger Williams out of 
uh, uh, Plymouth. And so he, he founds his own uh, colony called Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations. That's the official name of the state, Rhode Island and the Providence Plantations, or just Rhode Island. Um, and that's going to be the first uh, colony to offer religious freedom. Um, so let's talk about, um, I want to talk, go back and talk about, um, actually, no, here, we'll go to, uh, we'll talk about the middle colonies. Um, the middle colonies will be the really kind of the most diverse place in America. We're talking New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, New York used to be called New Amsterdam. It was settled by the Dutch um, and uh, in the uh, what, 1630s, I think, 1620s, 1630s, something like that. Um, but the Duke of York takes it over, and then it's called New York. Um, Pennsylvania is going to be founded by uh, William Penn, who was a Quaker, also known as the Society of Friends, which Richard Nixon was a Quaker. Uh, and they offered religious freedom. And in the 1770s, they, the Quakers will actually form the first anti-slavery society in America. Um, then if we jump to uh, the uh, southern colonies, um, the southern colonies uh, are going to try to uh, recreate um, the successes, the economic successes in the West Indies. That's the Caribbean uh, so the British had uh, some islands, Jamaica, Antigua, Barbados, um, where they were mainly go growing sugar, and uh, they were economic successes. They made lots of money off of, off of those islands, and they imp imported a lot of slaves uh, as well. Um, and that was very hard work, and a lot of them died from disease um, and just from the, you know, the nature of the work, and they were you know, replaced by the thousands and so they wanted to replicate that in um in uh north in the carolinas uh, and uh, they did so to a certain extent so i wanted now to kind of go back and look at um kind of the shift in labor or the use of labor um, for growing tobacco but also for sugar so if we go back to uh, Virginia, um, they needed labor for tobacco and, um, they, they didn't have lots of money to pay these people. So instead of paying them with money, they would pay people with land. So essentially what would happen is, um, you'd have these rich people in Europe and in America, and, um, they could, you know, round up some young men to send to, and they would pay for them to come to America. And for every person that they paid to come to America, they would get 50 acres. It was known as a head right. And so if you rounded up, you know, five men and, or, or women, it didn't matter, um, and sent them here, then you get 250 acres of land. And so these rich people became even richer by, uh, getting these head rights. Um, and so they were indentured servants the people that were sent over here because they got sent over here and they, and they got their, their trip paid for, um, they had to serve an indenture. They were essentially uh, slaves for five years. And then when they were done with that, um, they would get their freedom dues, which usually was like a gun, some clothes, um, maybe a barrel of, of corn. All right. Sorry. Um, so these, uh, indentured servants, um, would, uh, you know, get all their, their freedom dues. Um, we're going to see a shift though, from indentured servants to, uh, slaves from Africa. Now it's important to note that there were Africans that were indentured servants, so they would have got their freedom. So there were free, uh, Africans in America, uh, not a lot, but there were some. And so the question is, why do we shift from indentured servants to slaves? And a couple of reasons. First, as you can see, uh, Bacon's Rebellion. Um, this is Bacon 
um, and his followers, a lot of them former indentured servants, were upset because there's not a lot of good land anymore. A lot of the headrights, a lot of those rich people gobbled up that good land. And uh, they're mainly in the, in the frontier near Native Americans. And so they're, they're being attacked by Native Americans and the governor uh, is not really uh, protecting them. At least Bacon, Nathaniel Bacon doesn't think so. Um, and so they start this rebellion. They burn down Jamestown. Um, and during this kind of chaotic time period, we see a shift from uh, indentured servants to uh, African slaves. That's not the only reason, though. You can see here the price of slaves uh, will go down. Uh, and so that kind of justifies uh, the use of them more. Their life expectancy um, goes up, so they're living longer. But also the price of tobacco is falling. So the, because of the increased supply, it only makes sense that the price will go down. So they're not making as much money off of it. And so um, that's another reason why we see a shift to using slaves from Africa. So... Oh. All right, keep getting interrupted. People keep coming in the room, messing me up. All right, so uh, let's look at uh, triangular trade, also known as the Atl Atlantic economy. Um, and um, you can see this this map here of uh, what would happen. Usually, the uh, the Europeans. And now the countries involved in this is, you know, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, the British. They were all involved in this. Um, and so they would bring manufactured goods to Africa, like they would trade guns for slaves. And these, these Africans were essentially prisoners of war. You would have tribes that would fight each other. Um, one tribe would capture uh, Africans. Uh, from another tribe, bring them to the coast. It was rare that Europeans would actually enter into, in, go inland uh, in Africa. They'd get the slaves, then they would take the, uh, the journey to uh, the New World. That was known as the Middle Passage. Um, four to six weeks uh, on that Middle Passage. Now, and we looked at this in class, why didn't they take the slaves from you know, Northern Africa. Well, there's a few reasons. There's a big desert there, the Sahara Desert, but also Northern Africa, um, they are, uh, a lot of them are Arab Muslims there. And uh, versus if you go, you know, south of the, the desert there, uh, they're just various uh, tribes, essentially, at this time point, um, with their own tribal religions and uh, the Europeans believe that they would make better, a better source of labor than uh, the Muslims. Um, it's also important to note that most slaves did not come to British North America. Um, only about 5% of, of the total slaves imported to North and South America, only about 5% actually came to British North America. More went to the, the Caribbean, also known as the West Indies, or down into South America, like Brazil, places like that. Um, another uh, piece of information, between 1600 and 1800, there was about a million Europeans that came to America. Um, and in that same, you know, 200 year span, there was about 2.5 million Africans that came here by force. So in many colonies, um, there will be more slaves than uh free people. Um, looking at conflicts with Native Americans, there's just a couple things. And, and by the way, I have those the key concepts there, um, which I haven't mentioned yet, but that's essentially everything that you need to know. Um, so I have all those key concepts uh, in parentheses. So basically, you just need to know that uh, there was constant conflict with Native Americans throughout the colonies. You see uh, Pope's rebellion there with the Spanish Empire and Metacom's war, also known as uh, King, King Philip's war. And these were constantly uh, happening, whether it was in New England or Virginia, there was constant conflict with Native Americans. Now, the thing is, too, is that Native American, the individual tribes, they themselves were not united. If the tribes were all united, they probably would have stood a better chance of defeating 
at least in, in the beginning, the, uh, the colonists, but the tribes didn't even get along themselves in many instances. Um, and then we jump to the enlightenment and the first great awakening. Um, essentially what hap- what's happening here is that, uh, America is growing, um, kind of a, a shared identity uh, as the years go on. Whereas, you know, they were originally kind of 13, almost separate countries, very different from each other. You know, South Carolina was very different than, than New England. But some of these shared events, these shared experiences are going to bring them together. Like the first great awakening uh, will bring the colonies together. But also the, you know, dealing with Native Americans, that's something that was every colony face and that's something that wasn't happening in uh in england and so that was kind of a shared experience in america the first great awakening was a a reaction partially a reaction to the enlightenment the enlightenment is is the spread of uh, uh of ideas you know about democracy that that kings don't you know have a god given right to rule um that the world can be understood using reason and science uh, which a lot of religious people uh, viewed as an attack. An attack. So the First Great Awakening is partially a response to the Enlightenment. We'll come back to John Locke when we talk about um, the Revolution. All right. So that's uh, really a quick overview of uh, Period Two, which is 1607, which is the settling of Jamestown, to 1754, which is uh, the beginning of the French and Indian War. All right, I'm back. Took a little break. Um, talking about period three now. So period three uh, covers 1754 to 1800. A lot of stuff ha- stuff happening in uh, period three. Um, we'll have a revolution. We'll have a constitution. And we'll have uh, two presidents, George Washington and uh, John Adams. So I will put up the uh, period three key concepts again, same thing. You don't um, really need to do much with these, but you will see uh, as we go through this, um, I will put the individual key concepts that I'm talking about and then the uh, learning objective objectives. So you can pause the screen and uh, make sure that you can do all of these things. Um, Let's talk about the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. So 1754 to 1763, so the last nine years, hence the name Seven Years' War. Um, in America, we call it the French and Indian War because that's who we were fighting, the French and their native allies. And uh, But this was essentially a world war. Um, in Europe, they call it the Seven Years' War because it was fought for seven years over there. But it began... Uh, because of land disputes in the Ohio River Valley. So you can see in this map um, where Fort Duquesne is. Um, that's the Ohio River Valley there. Uh, essentially, the British thought that was their land. The French thought it was theirs. And it, it erupts into uh, a war. Um, and we see really the first battle or skirmish that was fight that was fought uh, was uh, with a young... George Washington, 21 years old, um, and uh, they kind of retreated after their little battle, and uh, George Washington built Fort Necessity, and I showed you a picture of that fort in class, and it was it's a pretty silly fort. Um, you don't need to know much about the fighting during the French and Indian War, um, but a couple important things that you need to know. One is the Albany Plan of Union. Um which took place at Albany Congress, um, where Benjamin Franklin was one of the um, uh, delegates. Um, and he came up, Benjamin Franklin came up with the Albany Plan of Union. Uh, and there's a famous cartoon that Benjamin Franklin made that routinely appears on AP exams, the Join or Die cartoon that a lot of people misinterpret. This is not calling for... Um, independence from Britain. So the Albany Plan of Union, essentially there's a short-term goal and a long-term goal. The short-term goal is to negotiate with the Confederation of the Iroquois. Um, 
so so to uh, negotiate with uh, Native Americans. The long-term goal is to unite the colonies. Now, there's no calls for independence yet. Uh, Benjamin Franklin wanted to unite all of the colonies. Uh, if anything, they would have been closer to uh, Britain. Um, it would have. Now, it's important to know that this actually never happened. The Albany Plan of Union never happened, but it would have created a president general that was appointed by the king, and it would have created a grand council, similar to like a congress, that would have been elected by the colonies. Um, now, this never happened because the individual colonies didn't want to give up uh, their power. Uh, but it's still an important event. So at the end of the war, the, at the end of the French and Indian War is really the important part because it's going to be kind of the beginning of our trek towards independence. So the war ends in 1763. Essentially, the French are out of America now. You can see on that map, the French are out. They will be back. Don't worry, because we got to buy Louisiana from them in 1803. But they're out for now. Uh, the British take all land east of the Mississippi from the French, and the Spanish take all land west of the Mississippi from the French. Um, but also the king uh, signs this proclamation of 1763 um, where colonists cannot um, move uh, west of that line, essentially along the Appalachian Mountains. Um, now the colonists don't listen. And, and the reason for the line is really to stabilize relations with the Native Americans. Um, if more people are moving west, they're going to come into conflict with Native Americans. The British didn't want that. Um, the colonists didn't didn't listen. Um, so in a way, you got to give the British credit. They were trying to, um, you know, not cause conflict. But what the British will do is they're going to keep troops. They're going to keep British troops, the regulars, uh, in America to to protect the colonists from. Native American attacks. Now, a lot of the colonists believe that the troops were there to kind of watch over the colonists. You know, are they there to protect us or to watch us? Um, and this kind of begins uh, our, I guess, hatred of uh, a standing army. That would be versus like a militia. So a standing army is essentially what we have today, you know, uh, on the military bases. We have, you know, they're ready to go at a moment's notice versus a militia where it's um, you, you know, uh, you're a farmer or whatever, but if, you know, something, someone needs help or a war breaks out, you'll, you'll take up arms. You're not actually a member of, uh, of a army officially. And so, uh, we don't like standing armies or historically we haven't liked standing armies. Uh, and really that dates back to 1763. So there's troops, uh, in America after the French and Indian war, the British win, but it's an ugly win. The British are almost bankrupt. And the thing is, though, people in England are some of the most highly taxed people as it is. And so the British need to raise money to pay their, to pay for the war and to keep troops in America. And they think that Americans should pay for that. And uh, in a way, that kind of makes sense. But uh, for the, the American, the colonists, uh, they don't like that idea of being taxed, of paying for troops in America. But what's interesting, if you go to other British colonies in the in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, uh, they wanted more protection. They wanted more troops because there was there was a, a higher likelihood of having slave rebellions there, and there were some successful slave rebellions in um, in those uh, islands. Whereas we don't really see successful slave rebellions in America or in the in, in the thirteen colonies. So this is not, you know, this is going on in other colonies as well, and you don't see the same reaction. Um, and so the British were kind of baffled uh, as we get towards closer towards independence. The British were kind of baffled that there was uproar over things like the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act because there wasn't that same uproar in the other colonies. So the British need to raise money. First thing that they do is... Uh, um, the uh, the Sugar Act of 1764, which actually reduced the tax on sugar, but um, they just started enforcing it. 
So in a sense, it felt like a tax increase because before no one was obeying, no one was paying that. It was a molasses act of 1733. No one was paying that. It was all smuggled. Um, so now they're enforcing essentially these navigation acts. And uh, so it felt like a tax increase. Um, one of the most important early taxes is going to be the Stamp Act 1765, where you needed a, um, to put a stamp on all these documents, newspapers, pamphlets, um, diplomas. But what you're doing here, what's interesting about the Stamp Act is you're actually, you are actually taxing the people that have the kind of the loudest voice, if you will, in America, lawyers, journalists. So you're upsetting them, people that actually can have a platform to speak out. Um, so there was uproar over the Stamp Act. A lot of people refused to pay it. And uh, eventually, Parliament, the British Parliament, repeals the Stamp Act, which is a win for the American colonists. And kind of, we have the slogan, no taxation without represent, representation. Essentially, the colon, colonists are saying, you, can't, you, don't, you don't have the authority to tax us unless you allow us to have a, a representative in, in Parliament so that we have a say in this. And the British were like, no, you're a colony. We don't, we don't really care what you think. Now, if they did allow America to have a representative, well, then are they going to allow their other colonies, Ireland, Australia, India? Um, probably not. So we see the formation of the Sons of Liberty. We also see the Daughters of Liberty, people that are boycotting British goods. The Sons of Liberty were the ones that uh, did the Boston Tea Party. Um, other other uh, taxes that we'll get, we'll get the Townsend Acts, uh, which is a tax on lead, paper, glass, and tea. Um, and a lot of kind of the uh, the uproar is in Boston. We're, we're not going to see as much down south. But in Boston, you know, that's where the Tea Party was. And so the Prime Minister of Great Britain will send troops to Boston. And in 1770, there's something called the Boston Massacre, where five people are killed. Um, because shots are fired there. People are heckling the, the British troops that are walking around in Boston and the Sons of Liberty are crying out that they want relief from tyranny, from the tyranny of a standing army, from the British. Um, and essentially they want their rights as Englishmen. They're not yet calling for independence. They want their rights as Englishmen. Um, and again, this is not happening in the islands, in, in Jamaica and Barbados. Uh, if anything, like I said, they want more protection. Um, in 1773, we get the Tea Act, uh, which essentially reduced the tax on tea for the East India Company, but cracked down on smuggled tea. The British, the, the tea from, from England was the best tea, um, but Americans really weren't drinking it because it was, it was too expensive. They would drink smuggled tea, which wasn't as good. Um, and so the Tea Act actually reduced the tax on tea for the East India Company because they had a, had a whole warehouse full of tea. And um, they delivered it to America, and they thought the Americans would uh, drink it all. And the Americans saw right through what they were doing um, and uh, dumped all the tea into Boston Harbor and caused you know, a few million dollars worth of loss. In response to that, we see the Coercive Acts, sometimes called the Intolerable Acts, which are four laws meant to punish Boston. So again, a lot of this is happening in Boston. Um, but still, really, we're not seeing calls for independence yet. Um, so we see the first Continental Congress that's formed after the Coercive Acts. You know, and basically, they send delegates, How? what are we going to do to help Boston? Um, and they encouraged Massachusetts where Boston is, to arm for their defense, and that we're going to boycott British goods. That's essentially what the First Continental Congress did. April 1775, we are going to get um, uh, the, uh, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. So the first shots are fired there. Um, and so at this time, we see this is according to John Adams. About a third of Americans were patriots, about a, meaning they supported... Um, kind of the, the American cause. A third were loyalists, loyal to Great Britain, and about a third were in the middle. So we needed to encourage the people in the middle to come over to our side. Usually the people that supported Britain had some sort of ties. Maybe their job 
was working for the government or they made money off of, you know, they needed the government there, the British. Um, so still not a lot of cause or not a lot of calls for independence, but things will change. In, so fighting starts in 1775 in April, but really they're not fighting for independence yet. They're fighting for their rights as Englishmen, but that will change. In January of 1776, we see Thomas Paine's Common Sense is published. And this is one of the, uh, the first times that we're actually seeing direct attacks on the king. Most of the attacks before this have been on parliament. Um, and they kind of they kind of share power at this time in, in Great Britain. But they thought, hey, if the king, if the king only knew what we were going through, he'd be sympathetic to our plight. And so they offer this olive branch petition, uh, kind of basically saying, hey, king, you let us tax ourselves internally. You regulate our trade our external trade and and we'll stay you know loyal to you the king rejects it um, and uh, and that upsets uh, a lot of members of the uh, the Second Continental Congress that was Second Continental Congress will be formed after the Battle of Lexington and Concord and so um, but also the back to the, the publication of common sense is really going to attack the uh, the king and um, and this was written in plain language for everyone to to read, and it was you know sold over a hundred thousand copies, and uh, really I think a major turning point in that now more Americans are supporting independence. And uh, then by July second, um, we declare independence, and um, I celebrate the second of July with fireworks and hot dogs. And then two days, two days later, everyone else celebrates because the 4th of July is the day they approved the document that was written by Thomas Jefferson. But the 2nd of July was actually the day they declared independence. 4th of, 4th of July, the day they, they approved the document that Thomas Jefferson wrote. He even said that it wasn't, these aren't all my ideas. I, he stole a lot of these ideas from John Locke, the ideas that uh, people have these natural rights life, liberty, and property, and government is instituted to protect those rights. And, and no one has a right, you know, no one um, has a right, you know, just because you're born into it or because God chooses you to, to be king. No one has that right. Um, which is interesting, too, because John Locke was, uh, said that slavery was okay, which seems hypocritical. Um, so um, the, the war, um, the fighting breaks out. We have the Second Continental Congress names George Washington as the commander of their army. One of the best things they did was doing that. Um, and uh, France will join the war and help us in 1778. Spain will join the war and help us too in 1779, mainly because they both hate Great Britain. And then in 1783, we get the Treaty of Paris. And uh, Britain recognizes... You can see on the map here, um, Britain, Britain recognizes everything uh, east of the Mississippi as uh, American territory. Some of these boundary disputes and some other trade disputes will be figured out with the War of 1812 in a little bit. So that is, uh, we are an independent country now. All right. So we're an independent country now. I want to talk about um, the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. The Articles of Confederation was uh, our first set of rules, if you will, that was originally written in 1777, so during the war, not ratified or approved until 1781. Why did it take four years? Really, it's because of disputes over Western land claims, um, where, you know, like... Um, colonies like New Jersey, for instance, they, there's no land west. They can't, they can't expand west because there's other colonies in the way. Uh, whereas Virginia can. They, can. they can keep going west all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And that's what essentially what Virginia said. All land, you know, they just kind of drew a line. Virginia just extends all the way to the Pacific. And uh, it wasn't until they gave up those land claims that the articles were approved. Um, but a confederacy is, is different than the system that we have, the federal system that we have. In a confederacy, essentially states 
operate as their own country. States are superior to the central government, government, whereas today the federal, which is our central government, the federal government is superior to states. Um, and with, it's really a loose alliance, uh, a loose alliance of friendship, if you will. And so it's meant to be weak, and it really was weak. And um, some of the reasons for that, as you can see, we are we are we have historically been fearful of too much power in far off places like London, um, and so we didn't want to do that. We wanted to keep all power close, local. So there's no president. It's only a legislative branch, unicameral legislature. Um, but every state is equal. Rhode Island is equal to uh, Virginia, the largest state. Um, Rhode Island likes that. Virginia doesn't really like that. Um, now, in order to pass any bills, they need nine out of 13 states to, to vote for that. So that's a supermajority. That's hard to do. And then to amend or to change the articles, you needed the support or approval of all states. And that n never happened. It was never um, amended. And that's one of the big problems with the articles is they were difficult, difficult to change. Um, and part of the problems with it, one of the main problems is it had to do with trade and tax collection. The articles didn't have any money. They couldn't force the states to pay taxes. Um, there was a bunch of, they didn't have, they couldn't regulate trade or commerce. The states um, regulated that themselves. So there could be, you know, 12 different trade agreements between the states. It was a mess. Um, and also they struggled militarily, things like Shays Rebellion, where you have a bunch of farmers in Western Massachusetts, uh, almost bring down the state government and, uh, they couldn't defeat a bunch of farmers. What's going to happen if the British attack us again, or, or if native Americans attack us? Um, so militarily not very strong, the successes. So there was a lot of failures, but the successes of the articles, uh, First, they created the post office, love the post office. You can send a letter all the way to, to Alaska for 50 cents, um, or you can send it downtown Spokane for 50 cents. It's, it's amazing. Um, but anyways, the land or ordinances really were the, the main successes. Essentially, it's figuring out, are we going to create new states? If we do create new states, are they going to be equal to the current 13 states, or are they going to be like lesser states? And the original 13 will be like super states. What's going to happen? Well, the land ordinances essentially create the process for new states. They create the Northwest Territory. There's going to be five states there Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Also, there's not going to be slavery there, which is uh, interesting. I wonder if there will be a fight over slavery later. Um, so the land ordinances were. Uh, this uh, main successes, lots of failures, Shays Rebellion, tax collection, trade. And uh, so in 1787, they, they decide to get rid of the articles and to create our current constitution. So in 1787, uh, they agree to meet uh, that summer in Philadelphia, um, originally to amend the articles, but when they get there, um, they decide just to get rid of it and to uh, start over again. And um, James Madison, who will be our fourth president, is really kind of the, uh, the he's known as the father of the Constitution. And he gets to Philadelphia weeks before anyone else with just stacks of books. And he's studying, you know, uh, various forms of government and, and you know, ancient Greece and stuff like that. And um, so at the Constitutional Convention, uh, in a way, I, I feel like you could argue that the Constitution um, was really to protect us from too much democracy, I guess. And that, that was the thing under the Articles of Confederation. A lot of people were saying, we need to protect us. You know, we need protection from the tyranny of the people. Not tyranny of the government, tyranny of the people. And um, that's that's kind of one of the main reasons for this Constitutional Convention. Um, so there's going to be a bunch of debates during this, and we know all of this stuff because of the notes from 
Madison. Um, and so just briefly, some of the main uh, arguments. The, the first one is really over representation, meaning in this new government that's going to form, how many representatives does each state get? Is it going to be like the Articles of Confederation where each state is equal? Or is it going to be, you know, based on something else like population? Meaning the more people you have in your state, the more representatives you get to send to the nation's capital, which is not Washington, D.C. yet. It will be uh, eventually. Um, and so uh, we have first the Virginia plan, and I have this picture that I drew that I showed you in class. Madison's plan is a Virginia plan. This would would have created a bicameral legislature, so bicameral meaning two houses, an upper house and a lower house. Eventually we will get that. It'll be the House of Representatives and the Senate. But for in Madison's plan, both houses, the amount of people you get to send is based uh, on population of the state. So states like Virginia, which with the largest population at that time, would get more representatives. They would have more power than a smaller state like Rhode Island. Well, the smaller states don't like that. So we have the uh, another competing plan, which is the New Jersey plan. This would have created a unicameral legislature similar uh, to government under the articles. Uh, so unicameral, meaning one house, and each state would have been equal, like it was uh, in the Articles of Confederation. The large states don't like that. Um, so they compromise, and we get the Great Compromise, sometimes called the Connecticut Compromise, which is pretty much our current system besides some changes that happened during the Progressive Era in 1913. Um, so in the House of Representatives, so we have a bicameral legislature, it's what we have today. Um, the House of Representatives, um, they serve two-year terms, they are elected by the people, and the amount of people, that amount of representatives you get is based on the population of your state. The original number, I believe, was 30,000. So one, you get one representative for every 30,000 people. Now, that number changes after every census. Um, now it's like over 700,000 people, something like that. You get one representative. So the whole eastern part of Washington State, we have one representative, and that's Kathy McMorris Rogers. Um, California has the most representatives. I think they have 53, uh, whereas Wyoming has one. And so in the House of Representatives, California uh, and other large states like Texas and New York have much more power than smaller states like Wyoming or Alaska or Montana, North Dakota, places like that. And the House of Representatives was supposed to be a, really at the whim of the people. Um, in general, the House of, House of Representatives, I would argue, is more radical, whereas the Senate is more moderate. So um, the House is usually you know, either more conservative or more liberal. I would argue than the Senate because it changes every two years. So right now, um, the House is controlled by the Democrats. Um, whereas the Senate, they serve six-year terms. Um, it's less likely to change uh, as much because they are staggered. So it's it's not replaced like the House is replaced every every two years. They could all be replaced, but the, um, only a third of the Senate are up for election. Uh, so every two years, a third of them are up. And so it's it's much harder to uh, change them. And for up until 1913, uh, senators were chosen by state legislatures, meaning the, the politicians in state capitals would choose the senators that went to the nation's capital. That changes during the Progressive Era. So that was the first fight, was over representation. Um, and we get our, our current system, which has worked out fairly well. Um, then there was debates over, you know, how are we going to elect the president? Are we going to let the people choose the president? Well, no, they didn't trust the people. Again, with this constitution, we're trying to protect against tyranny of the people, of too much democracy. So we're not going to have people elect the president. We can't have politicians do it either. And so we create something called the Electoral College, where we will have these electors. These are supposed to be stand-up people, people in the community that will be trusted. They will choose the president. And that's what we have today. So the people don't directly elect the president. The system has changed uh, over the years, uh, but we still technically have electors. And each state's worth a certain amount of points. You add up the amount of 
representatives you have plus senators and you get your points. So California has 53 representatives, I think, plus two senators. So they are worth 55. Whereas Wyoming with their one representative and two senators, they are worth three points. Um, they did not address slavery. They were worried about a fight over slavery might um, destroy the whole convention. Um, they did create the three-fifths compromise because the, the, one of the main issues is, do we count slaves? Do slaves count as people as, as far as representation goes? And the South wanted slaves to count because if slaves count, the South, again, they're not talking about giving them you know, uh, uh, the chance to vote, but if slaves count, then the South will get more representatives. Then the South will have more political power. And then the South will actually be worth more points in the Electoral College. And so we get the three-fifths compromise, which is every five slaves count as three people for representation. And that's one of the main reasons why a lot of presidents, at least in the beginning, will be from the South, is because of, uh, uh, of this three-fifths compromise. Um, and they will be worth more in the electoral uh, college. Um, so uh, those three things with the Constitution are important, representation, the electoral college, and uh, dealing with slavery. Now they have to ratify this Constitution. And uh, we have the Federalists who are in favor of the Constitution versus the Anti-Federalists who are opposed to it. Really, they are opposed to it until, until a Bill of Rights is added. The Bill of Rights will be added. Those are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, like freedom of speech, rights against illegal search and seizure, you have a right to a lawyer, all that stuff. Those are uh, among the 10 uh, amendments, first 10 amendments. Um, and in 1789, nine out of the 13 states finally ratified the Constitution, so it's essentially activated. And we get our first president unanimously elected in 1789 by the Electoral College, and that is George Washington. So uh, George Washington, who in a way he didn't really want to be president, he wanted to retire. Um, but it was, you know, he had an important job. He really held the country together and he set a lot of precedents, meaning things that other presidents will follow. And he knew that he was doing this. And uh, one of the first things that he thought about doing, because uh, he owned slaves, uh, so did the, his wife. His wife actually owned more slaves than he did. Um, but he thought about um, freeing all of his slaves before becoming president. Um, and that would have set a precedent, meaning other presidents uh, would have been expected, not legally, but expected to do the same as Washington did. And Washington wanted to do it, but he was kind of fearful at setting a precedent like that. So he never actually did that. He did free his slaves uh, when he died upon his death, um, but he never did set that precedent about freeing your slaves before he become president, which would have been interesting to see. Um, so some of the main issues briefly, I'll, I put up this, uh, just kind of brief overview of his presidency. Another precedent that he set is he only served two terms. There were no term limits. He could have served for life. They loved him. But he was worried, if I do this, other presidents will try to do the same thing. So he only serves two terms. Even though he could have served more, there were no term limits yet. Um, and every president since either wanted to serve two terms um, or did. And uh, it's not until Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s and 40s that we get someone that serves more than two terms. Then after that, now we have term limits, so you can't serve more than two terms. Um, uh, some of the main issues of his presidency is the creation of a national bank. Uh, we'll talk about that and the fight between Hamilton and Jefferson um, soon here. The Whiskey Rebellion where uh, they're going to put an excise tax, essentially a sales tax on whiskey. And uh, people in Pennsylvania will be upset. And uh, he uh, sends in troops. He himself is leading troops to kind of squash this rebellion. And uh, you can imagine a president today, you know, leading troops in the battle. You, you wouldn't see that. Um, <clears throat> but he's kind of showing the strength of the country, that you're not going to mess with 
this new federal government. You know, whereas before it was Shays' Rebellion, um, you know, that, that they had a tough time uh, uh, defeating them. Whereas the Whiskey Rebellion, they were going to kind of flex their muscles and show off the strength of this new federal government. We have Jay's Treaty, which brings us closer to um, uh, Great Britain. So kind of, um, you know, uh, ending our alliance with France and kind of getting closer to, uh, to Great Britain. And I'll put up the uh, foreign policy after the war um, slide, um, where after the French Revolution, 1789, France starts fighting Great Britain. And we had this alliance with France that we got during the Revolutionary War. Washington's going to proclaim neutrality, that, that we're not going to help France in this war. We're not going to get involved in this war between Great Britain and France. And uh, we're going to stay neutral. And if anything, cozy up closer to Great Britain with things like Jay's Treaty. Um, and uh, when he leaves, so political parties weren't a thing. They will be created partially because of his cabinet and Hamilton and Jefferson and, and the fighting between them. Uh, but he warns in his farewell address against political partisanship. He warns against political parties, against sectional sectionalism, the uh, kind of the country uh, being uh, divided into various sections, really slave and and non-slave. Because uh, we're going to see the first states. Uh, Vermont was the first state to get rid of slavery in the 1770s, and many New England states getting rid of slavery. Um, at that time period. And so the country is kind of growing uh, further apart. I wonder if we'll have a war because of slavery. I don't know. Um, and he says that we should not get involved in uh, European affairs. We shouldn't have permanent alliances because Europe's always fighting. We should stay out uh, of their affairs. And uh, of course, we listened to him. We never got involved in World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, nothing like that. That never happened. Um, and so that's George Washington, um, 1789 to 1797. Um, let's talk about uh, Hamilton and Jefferson, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So George Washington creates his, uh, his political cabinet, even though it doesn't say he has to, but he does. And, and again, the job of president is really to carry out the law, not to create the law. Congress creates the law. And so he picks uh, his very good cabinet. Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury and uh, Jefferson as Secretary of State. And really, Hamilton's job is to get the economics of the country figured out. Um, and he does that. Um, and, and really, you could argue, makes America an economic powerhouse or sets us on a path towards being an economic powerhouse. Um, and so Hamilton wants to, the first thing he wants to do is he wants to assume all state war debt um, from the Revolutionary War. So meaning instead of states paying that debt, it would be the job of the federal government. The problem is, is that uh, many uh, southern states had already paid off their debt and many northern states didn't. And so it seemed that this would benefit northern states where Hamilton was from. He's from New York. We're not from there, but that's where he lived. Um, and so many southern states were opposed to it. Now we're going to have this compromise where um, Jefferson, who was kind of a proponent or opposed to this, and um, agrees to support Hamilton's plan. And in exchange, the capital, the nation's capital, would be moved to um, the south, to the Virginia-Maryland border, which is Washington, where Washington, D.C. is. Um, and then um, he wants to create this national bank really to help the economics to, to, uh, to do all this government business. Um, and this is a fight between Hamilton and Jefferson. Essentially, Jefferson is opposed to the national bank because Jefferson doesn't say you can do it in the Constitution. Doesn't think that, that um, Congress has that power. Um, and this is known as a, uh, a strict constructionist point of view. That you can't do it if the Constitution doesn't allow it. If it doesn't specifically say you can do it, then you can't. Hamilton, uh, with a looser, broad uh, constructionist viewpoint, says it doesn't say I can't do it. You got to read between the lines. It's one of my 
you know, powers that are necessary and proper and carrying out other powers. Um, so using the necessary and proper clause or the elastic clause that you will learn more about in civics next year. Um, Hamilton says, I can, I can um, build this national bank. And George Washington sides with Hamilton. In the Supreme Court with John Marshall years later in McCulloch versus Maryland also agrees with Hamilton. So Hamilton really wins uh, this battle. We get these political parties. We get the Federalists or the Hamiltonians versus the Jeffersonians, who are known as the Democratic Republicans, or sometimes just called the Republicans. But usually we call them Democratic Republicans because we don't want you to get confused with the other Republicans that are created in 1854, the party of Lincoln, those Republicans. So that, that brings us really to 1797, um, even though this period goes to 1800 and the election of 1800. I think we'll save that lecture for later. We'll talk about the presidency of John Adams, the election of 1800, and then Thomas Jefferson. So I hope you had fun. I sure did. Um, this concludes our lecture. So um, bye-bye. <laughs>